Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Austin, Director of Wilmette Public Library. On behalf of the Library Board and staff, we are pleased to welcome you to the signature event of our 2023 One Book Everyone Reads Community Reading Program. Tonight, author Kevin Wilson will be joining us in conversation with Allison Cuddy to discuss this year's selected book, Now Is Not the Time to Panic. We would like to thank the friends of the Wilmette Public Library for funding our One Book Everyone Reads program and for their ongoing support of library programs and events. You can learn more about the friends and how to support their work on our website, wilmettlibrary.info. Before I introduce our guests, a bit of housekeeping. Tonight's presentation is a Zoom webinar where you, the audience, can see and hear us, but we, the presenters, cannot see or hear you. This program is being recorded and will be uploaded to the library's YouTube page. For accessibility, closed captioning has been enabled. If you cannot see the captions, you may need to adjust your Zoom settings. Our event will conclude with an audience Q&A session at the end of the discussion. If you wish to participate, you can submit questions to the Zoom question and answer section at any time. We will do our best to address everyone's questions. If you haven't had a chance to read, now is not the time to panic, contact Wilmette Public Library or your own local library to borrow a copy. If you wish to purchase a copy of the book, we invite you to do so from our partner and local bookstore, The Bookstall, to receive a copy of the title with a specially signed book plate by the author. All right, now to our main event. Allison Cuddy is a Chicago writer and curator. She is the former host of WBEZ's award-winning program 848 and artistic director of the Chicago Humanities Festival. Currently, she serves on the boards of the Arts Club of Chicago and the Chicago Reader. And in 2019, she was appointed by Mayor Lightfoot to serve as the vice chair of the City of Chicago's Cultural Advisory Council. Kevin Wilson is the author of three novels, The Family Fang, Perfect Little World, and Nothing to See Here, a New York Times bestseller and a Read with, and a Read with Jenna book club selection. He's also written two story collections, Tunneling to the Center of the Earth, which received an Alex Award from the American Library Association and the, and the Shirley Jackson Award, and Baby, You're Gonna Be Mine. His fiction has appeared in Plowshares, Southern Review, One Story, Best American Short Stories 2020 and 2021, as well as the Penn and O. Henry Prize Stories of 2021. He has received fellowships from the McDowell Colony, Yaddo, and the KNH Center for the Arts. He lives in Suwannee, Tennessee, with his wife, poet Leanne Couch, and his sons, Griff and Patch, where he is an associate professor of the English Department of Suwannee, the University of the South. I'm pleased to introduce Allison Cuddy and in conversation with Kevin Wilson. Thank you. All right. Well, I think it's time for me to start. Uh, I can't see anyone, but I'm I'm imagining that there's at least one person. So I'm going to say thank you to one and maybe more people that have chosen to attend. Um, it really means a lot. Uh, uh, it's just such such a you spend so much of your time in isolation writing this these these weird books and and you send them out into the world and you just you have no idea uh, how that signal is going to reach the receiver. And so moments like this, these opportunities to talk to people are really important and really helpful for me, especially since I live on a mountain in, in the middle of nowhere. So, um, and I, and I'm really grateful, um, in advance for the, for the conversation with Allison. Um, so I, I'm going to start just by reading a very small piece of the novel and then talking a little bit about how it came to be. Um, the smart person would read the very first chapter, right, and just get everybody settled. I'm, I, I've read the first chapter so many times that I thought I would read something else. So I'll just do a quick little recap. Uh, it's about a young woman, Frankie, who her, she meets this boy, Zeke. They're 16 years old in this small town called Coldfield, Tennessee. And over the course of this summer, they create this poster where uh, Frankie writes this strange phrase and Zeke illustrates it. They make hundreds and hundreds of copies and post them all over uh, their small town. And it creates initially a, a, a huge panic in the town, but it eventually becomes a kind of national mystery uh, that no one has ever solved uh, until this very moment when Frankie, who is now an adult, realizes that someone has figured it out and it forces her to go back and think about 
this this one transformative summer in her life. Um, so I'm going to read a small thing about the poster itself, this is after they've been putting them up and it's become so kind of viral that other people are now doing it in the town. And I was going to show you um, people, one of the strangest things is that people have sent me the poster. So I'll show you like, it looks kind of like this. There's hands, there's little kids in beds and it's the line uh, that, and somebody made a t-shirt too looks kind of like this, but um, the line is, the edge is a shanty town filled with gold seekers. We are fugitives and the law is skinny with hunger for us. It's a, it's a nonsensical line, but it, it has a uh, deep meaning for lots of people. They put whatever they want into it. So this is as the summer progresses and other people have decided to put up the poster, not, not just Frankie and Zeke. And it's, I wanted to read it just to read a little bit about like this is set in 1996 and kind of what it's like to grow up in a small town, small rural town like I did in the 90s. This is uh, Frankie has three brothers, uh, Andrew, um, Brian and Charlie. Brian told us that he saw Lyle Tawater wearing an Oakland Raiders t-shirt and black sweatpants hanging up the poster on a gas pump at the Golden Gallon. Lyle was 22 and had broken his back in high school when his four-wheeler flipped. His sister had been riding behind him and was still in a coma at a hospital in Knoxville. And Lyle, this quiet little country kid, got real weird when he got out of the full body cast, started going to flea markets and buying old fixed blade knives and remaking them into strange, almost medieval looking devices of violence, which he then sold at craft festivals. He always had the slightest fuzz on his upper lip, the most delicate blonde hairs, but his eyes were crazy. Brian asked Lyle if he was a fugitive and Lyle smiled and put his index finger to his lips. He got back into his car and said, I'm one of them and drove off. Brian had removed the poster and showed it to me. It wasn't a Xerox of our poster, but Lyle's own version, the lines so dark and angry, almost vibrating. He'd recreated my phrase exactly, but the hands looked skeletal. And in the bed was a single person, a little girl hooked up to machines. I imagine Lyle still living with his mom, sitting in his room and making more than a dozen copies of this poster by hand. It didn't make me sad for some reason. I mean, Lyle had always made me sad to have ruined your life and the life of the person you love most in the world because you took a turn too fast but this felt like a kind of grace. I wondered how many he would have to hang for his sister to awaken for her, from her coma. Whatever the number, it seemed worth trying. And Zeke and I saw this girl, Madeline, hanging posters without any real fear of being caught, just stapling them to trees in the park. Madeline had been a cheerleader in junior high, but then I don't know exactly why, because I wasn't aware of the complex negotiations required to be popular, she'd quit and started hanging out with the theater kids. She wasn't a goth, not really, because I don't think anyone really knew exactly what that was. I mean, she listened to Nine Inch Nails. She wore a lot of black eyeliner. We didn't know what to call that, but we just knew that Madeline was suddenly not the Madeline who had been the sturdy base of the pyramid during pep rallies. She was transformed. And I can't quite articulate how in so many ways Coalfield controlled how the outside world came to you. You never really knew about punk until you heard Green Day on the radio long after they were popular. And if you love that, maybe you started doing a little work. I mean, we did not even have MTV in our cable package. You had to buy a spin or a Rolling Stone and you started to work backward, learning about the Sex Pistols. And once you knew those two bands, you had to work harder to fill in the middle. And if you were lucky, somebody's cousin had given them a tape of Minor Threat and they gave you a dub of it. Or you went to spinners and just looked endlessly at the used cassette tapes until you picked one that had an interesting cover. And maybe you just happened to buy Black Flag's My War. But no matter what, you were never quite experiencing anything in a linear way. And you were always kind of embarrassed because you knew other people. People in Nashville or Atlanta knew all of this in the exact order it was meant to be consumed. And so you didn't really talk about it. 
You kept it all locked up inside of you, and suddenly you were sending cash and envelopes to record labels you read about in Maximum Rock and Roll, and you got a seven-inch record of some punk band in Wisconsin that would never record another song. It was like this for me with books. After I'd read every single Nancy Drew book twice, I found The Chocolate War in school library, and I told the librarian I liked it, and she gave me The Outsiders. And then my mom gave me Flannery O'Connor, and I started grabbing anything I could find, and I had no idea what other people thought was good or what was important. And so I almost never told anyone what I liked because I was terrified they would tell me how stupid it was. Every single thing that you loved became a source of both intense obsession and possible shame. Everything was a secret. Madeline saw me staring at her and she just smiled. I don't think she even knew who I was, but she made devil horns with her right hand and mouthed the words, we are fugitives. And I nodded. So, okay, that's, that's the little thing. Um, and then uh, uh, I was going to just talk a little bit about how, how the book came to be, um, which I think is a kind of strange story and, and maybe more personal than, than a fictional book should be, but I don't know how else to, I only, I really just write books for me. Uh, and that's a problem because then you don't know if anyone else is going to read it or care about it. But, but for me, I just am writing it to figure some stuff out. Uh, and fiction works better for me. But I, I do want to say that the, the, the phrase in the book, the transformative phrase, is, is not something I, I, I wrote. It was something that a friend of mine, uh, a boy named Eric Haley, uh, wrote and made up. And, and, I've, uh, and I used it in the book. And so I'll talk a little bit about how that came to be. So I, I grew up in a town that is very much Coalfield. It's called Winchester, Tennessee, super rural. Um, and I ended up going to uh, a school in Nashville called Vanderbilt University. And my freshman year, the second I got there, I realized how far behind I was everybody else. Like I, I think culturally, class-wise, uh, academically, and I just felt so out of my depth. And I had to work so hard just to keep up. And it was a pretty miserable year. And that summer, I moved into an apartment with my cousin, who was four years older than me and his best friend, Eric. And Eric was, um, he had gone to NYU film school. He had just finished his master's in theater at the University of Alabama. He was moving after the summer to go be an actor in LA. Uh, he was one of the most, I mean, he was the maybe the most charismatic person I had ever met up to that point. He was beautiful and charming and super kind. And we spent that whole summer together and he would make little short films. He showed me how to use editing equipment. He was like the first person who was my age who was like, art is fun and you can make stuff because it's fun and it's not nothing that matters. You can do whatever you want. Um, and that was hugely important to me. So that summer also, I was working at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, the hospital. And I worked in network computing, and my job was to take the policy and procedures manual, which was like 600 pages, and convert it to HTML and put it online for the first time ever, to have it online. And I got the job because the boss who interviewed me said, do you know HTML? And I thought he meant, had I ever heard of it in my life? And I nodded. I said, yes. And he said, well, if you know HTML, you'll be fine. And so they put me in this closet. And no one ever checked on me for a ever. The, there was a huge tornado and everyone in the building went to the basement, but they forgot about me. And I was on the seventh floor just typing HTML language. And I got a book, HTML for Dummies, and I just typed this 500 page manual by hand. And I got so bored. And I eventually just started making stuff up. And in almost every single section, I would make up sentences and write stuff and tell these strange little stories and nobody noticed. So I just kept doing it and no one ever checked. And so eventually I asked Eric, I said, Hey, I'm doing this. Do you have anything you'd like to me to put in? And he said that line, the edge is a shanty town filled with gold seekers. We are fugitives and the law is skinny with hunger for us. And, and the minute he said it, um, this was 1996, it burned into my brain. 
And I have probably said that line at least once every single day for the rest of my life. Um, I just, it's a kind of mantra. And I put it in my first book, The Family Thing. And I thought I'd be done with it and I wasn't and just kept saying it. And uh, eventually I was like, I'm going to write a whole book just about this line. I'm going to figure it out. And I went on NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross and she asked me for nothing to see here. My previous novel, she asked, what am I working on? And I, I mentioned the line and I mentioned this novel and I mentioned Eric. I had not seen Eric in a while. He had moved to LA. He had done some acting. He'd done mostly production work. And we would see each other. We would fall in and out of each other's orbit. But as you become adults, it's it was never like that summer. Um, but we still talked. And uh, after that interview, I get a text uh, to my email from a number I don't recognize. And it's it's Eric. And he says, hey, I love this. This is so cool. And I said, I'd love to talk to you about it. Could we meet? And he, uh, we set up a time. He was going to be in Nashville. And the day we were supposed to meet, uh, he calls me and says, um, my brother has has passed away. And uh, I said, it's no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll see each other another time. And I kept working on the book. And then uh, uh, I was probably like, probably three fourths of the way through with the novel. And just one night I got a call from my cousin, Brian. And he was like, Eric's, Eric is dead. Uh, Eric had um, basically had liver failure and kidney failure and uh, uh, had been diagnosed with cirrhosis and kidney failure and like a week later just just collapsed and died and and he was gone. And so uh, I really struggled with figuring out how to what what I was doing with this novel, like why, why I was writing it. My, my whole idea was that I would publish the book and it would bring Eric uh, like back into my orbit, you know, for some like I thought it would bring us back to that summer. And my wife and my agent, who are both like the two, the only two people that read my work, we're both like, you know, this is fiction. It's not you. And that's why you write fiction so that you can write yourself towards whatever you want for these characters. You know, this is Frankie and Zeke. And, and so I just kind of, you know, that that's the transformative power of art is that you can, you can put whatever you need into it to get yourself from point A to point B. And so I finished the book and the book came out and it was really weird and strange and I wasn't maybe prepared for it, but it was actually kind of lovely. Cause like I went on the today show and Jenna Bush and Hoda are saying this line that my friend Eric made up in 1996 and people email me, people have gotten a tattoo. Like it's, it is like, and every time I hear the line, this thing that has been in my head really and truly, like I've said it every day for 20 some odd years, um, suddenly it was out in the open air and other people were saying that. And each time I heard it, it was like hearing Eric a little bit in my head. And, and, you know, I wrote the book and it's, it's a work of fiction. Um, but I got this charge out of, out of finally figuring out what I wanted to do with that, with that line. And that's, you know, how the book came, came to be. Um, I think I'll just stop there because uh, I'm, 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 it's difficult to talk without another person to talk to. And I, I, I'd like, I'm grateful to Allison for agreeing to talk to me. So I'm, I'm happy to do that now. Oh, um, thank you, Kevin. It's wonderful to be able to talk with you. So thank you. Uh, I love the passage that you read. Um, it's, it is at the heart of the book, I or it's sort of, it, it has so many of the elements of the book that make this so amazing. I mean, the sense of place in this small town and what it was like in the mid nineties to live in a place like that, or a lot of places really pre-internet. It's got, you know, the wonderful characters that you draw, like even in a few sentences, you create this person for us that we really feel attached to. And I think that's just such a gift. Um, and it's got a theme that I really wanted to ask you about that you've, you've talked about a lot already, um, which is, um, I think it's a theme of this book powerfully, but also of your other books um, of Nothing to See Here or uh, The Family Fang, um, which is secrecy and that kind of tension between what's private and what's public. And um, it sounds like in some ways you're working out things for yourself that are like in you and, and what, why they're meaningful to you. But I wondered if you could talk more generally what interests 
asked you about that kind of the idea of secrecy and obsession. Oh, that's lovely. And thank you for those kind words. I really appreciate it. I mean, I think I write a lot about like uh, uh, obsession and secrecy and like everything being internal, um, partly because that's just the way I lived my whole life. You know, I was, I think from a really early age, I was a kind of obsessive child, but also like mentally I struggled with um, what what now had as an adult, I got diagnosed with Tourette's, but at the time I had no idea, but there was always like this kind of agitation inside of me, like recurring thoughts, like weird tics. And I felt like most of my, a lot of my childhood was I, and it's in, in a lovely childhood, like, like great with wonderful parents who like, made me feel seen and were super happy to see me do anything creative. But, but at the same time, it was a constant struggle of how do I, how do I hold inside of myself this weirdness so that it doesn't seep out and like, uh, get me ruined. And so I think I write a lot about that, which is that those obsessions and those strange things that I thought were like I had to keep hidden were also the things that like kept me alive like they were those obsessions were what kind of generated my own desires to like do things or be in this world and it helped me connect to the larger world but I was always afraid of how deeply do I reach out how deeply do I show elements of myself to the world for fear of like of being ruined and I think in a lot of ways, like I write about characters who have secrets, who have things that they want to keep hidden. And part of it is just like, I mean, the only reason I really make art is like, I'm just trying to figure out like how to take the things inside of me and fictionalize them in a way so that I can make a story that might resonate for another person. And so I've said it and I don't mean it in a silly offhanded way. I think I kind of write the same book over and over again. Uh, cause I'm just trying to still figure out some of those elements. So I have, what that means is since I'm aware of the fact that I'm writing the same book over and over again, I try to radically change like character or like conceit so that I can get people to still read another book of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, there, are, it, it may be, there may be similar themes across them, but they are all very different, um, and entertaining in their own rights. Um, I love that kind of the juxtaposition. I, well, a couple of questions. I mean, I had so many questions for you now, hearing you talk about the book, I have a million more. Um, <laughs> but, um, one is, you know, coming of age in that era of pop culture, which as I said, you describe really beautifully what that feels like. And one of the things that, um, Frankie says, you know, she's like, we were responsible for one of the weirdest mysteries in American pop culture. It was like, what a thing, right? To do this small private act and have it become this huge thing, as you say. Um, but that era, um, like you're saying, like, you know, you're, <laughs> HTML, we kind of all like know what that is, but we don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> things kind of move about in different ways because it's sort of pre-internet even though what's happening in this book feels a little like the internet like something's gone viral um how do you think in terms of it's obviously part of the content of this book but how did coming of age at that moment and being very deeply invested in in popular culture in books and movies and games and things like that how did that shape you creatively well i think like one was um because Again, like we did not have MTV, uh, whatever, whatever reason, our county would not allow that on our cable package when we finally got cable. So even then I felt a weird lack, like I, so much of my life was like, okay, there are these popular things in the world and I know little pieces of it, but I don't have access to all of it. And so what that meant was I really relied on like any movie that came out, I would drive to the Oldham Theater and what I would watch one or two movies a week because I knew I was watching a movie that somebody in New York City or somebody in Portland, Oregon was also watching. It was my uh, pop culture was a way for me to feel like I am experiencing something that other people in a place I can't even imagine are experiencing. That's why I also read like Spin Magazine and People Magazine because I was like, okay, this is the source. This is where I'm going to see it. And honestly, 
honestly, like, I, I, I loved, I, if I had had the internet when I was a teenager, my God, to have heard music uh, that I couldn't find in my little town would have been just beautiful. But one of the things about growing up in the 90s when I did was you were so dependent on chance uh, to discover anything. And uh, it made me weirdly obsessive. And I can just say like, like we had three video stores and one of them was action video and it had movies from the seventies and eighties. And I would just spend hours in there grabbing anything I could find and finding just the strangest. Like I found a weird movie called the big crime wave, a Canadian independent film that for the longest time, they, they didn't even have it on DVD. I saw that when I was 15 and it transformed me. It was like one of the most incredible things. And I didn't even know if it was real because I couldn't even find it online. But if I had not gone to the action video and found that particular thing, how much of my world would have been shaped differently? And it's a little strange, but I kind of love it. I love that like I had to dig through everything to find something that resonated. It made me work hard. And it also meant that because I couldn't have the stuff that I wanted, like sometimes I had to make it myself, me and my friends. And that was also kind of lovely um, that, that I thought I was inventing. We thought we were inventing stuff, but we weren't, we just didn't know it existed. And I think that helped me as an artist, as I moved forward, maybe it helped me because I was just stealing stuff from people I didn't know had made it before, but it was helpful for me to think, okay, I'll, I'll make it because I can't find it. Do you feel, do you still, yeah, I was thinking there used to be a video store here called Odd Obsession, and it was like the same thing. You could go there and find the oddest, most fascinating things um, and discover culture in a way through happenstance, like you're saying, or chance. Do your, you have two children, um, and you're obviously immersed in culture. Do you still have that connection to culture in that way? Do you, do your children have that? Do you see them having that possibility? Yeah, I mean, I still think there's weird stuff that you can find. And I think my children are both obsessive in different ways. And I just think all human beings are looking for something that animates them, that resonates with them, that makes them feel less alone in the world. And so like, you know, I thought like, oh, I have consumed as much pop culture as any person who grew up when I did could, you know, like it's not possible. But then during the quarantine, my oldest son, Griff, was like, I am going to watch this show called Doctor Who and I'm going to watch it in chronological order. <laughs> he watched every single one of them. It was This is a thing I had never heard of. I knew it existed, but I didn't know what it was. And I was like, oh, you found something that animates you and that's lovely. And my youngest son loves basketball and I do too, but he loves it with such a ferocity and his ability to like watch every single game if he wants to, to find all of these like connective tissue to all these different players. like. I think they can find it maybe a little more easily than I could, but you still dig. You still want every single thing that you can find about it. And they've chosen, I mean, Griff has chosen Doctor Who, which is bottomless. And actually, this in thank at Thanksgiving for I mean, we're probably we 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 flew to Chicago for this TARDIS festival to go meet like these doctors from the, the 70s. And he was so happy. I was like, yes, there's still possibilities to find these things that you love that seem hidden. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um, I talked about how much I like your characters and um, I want to describe one of my favorite characters is Hobart, who just starts off as kind of, you know, maybe he's not going to be very important. He's just sort of, you know, maybe Frankie's mom's boyfriend, maybe not. And then he plays a role in what happens with um, the poster that they make. But then he and um, Frankie evolved this really beautiful relationship. But you describe him like, you describe him, this is about to pop your culture, like if Lester Bangs, a famous um, rock critic, wrote about 4th of July cake contests instead of the Stooges. Um, or when Frankie meets up with Zeke later in life as Ben, like when she, re-meets him she writes he looked like he was one of two things a man who made coffee tables from reclaimed driftwood and sold them for three grand or a man who was very very suspicious of the circumstances of 9-11 like huh. that just seems to encapsulate something about our culture at this moment <laughs> where do these come from for you I mean what what's the source of those kinds of like ideas about people 
I mean, one, I'm just fascinated by people because I'm terrified of people. Like I, I have both like a real desire like to observe and watch and learn because I'm just fascinated by like how every single person has these strange things that animate them that if you can look long enough, you'll find them. Uh, but I'm also, um, because I'm a little scared of people, I have to work really hard not to um, uh, invent narratives for why I should never ever interact with anyone in the world ever. And so fiction is really good for me because it forces me to like embrace like, yes, these are people I probably don't want to be around or hang out with, but like, can I find the tender part that allows me to connect with them? And I think, you know, making art is useful for the real world because you spend enough time with anyone in fiction. I, I really, I, I really like the longer you spend, the more you start to find little things that you can hold on to that make them worthwhile. And that forces me when I go out into the real world to not just be terrified, but like, you know, only Lester Bangs gets to be Lester Bangs, right? Like, but there were all these dudes like that because of their circumstances or lack of talent or just where they were, but they're just smack dab in the middle of these small towns and wearing Hawaiian shirts and look, listening to strange music and watching strange movies. And at first Hobart was just the gross, weird dude that, that Frankie's mom is dating but he wouldn't leave the story. And then uh, the longer she spent with him, the more she found points of connection. And then the more I found points of connection and there's, you know, and then for me, I think he gives maybe like the only thing that really resonates for Frankie, which is just like, maybe you'll never be happy. Like maybe you'll never find your place in the world, but like there's enough in the world to stay alive and, and, and still be here. And Sometimes I, I hate when people are like, oh, eventually this will all work out for you and you'll be happy and everything will be perfect. And I was happy that Hobart gave her something like that. And it was wild that he's the one. Yeah, it's so beautiful. It made me, you know, I mean, in some way we're, we're, we think that he never knew her secret, but in some ways he knew the secret in her, right? He didn't know about the poster, mm -hmm. but he knew who she was. And so he says that to her. It's such a beautiful moment. And it... It's another, for me, a through line in your work that, um, you know, people come to realize that maybe they don't feel right in the world and they make their peace with it, more or less, you know, like I think um, Frankie does, she goes on this, this thing that it makes her different is what makes her a great writer, you know, um, but there are others like, um, in nothing to see here that that don't like I feel like Lillian eventually the main character of that book does kind of understand who she is and embrace it even though she's in some ways failed to launch but Madison her friend is sort of like no she's weird but she's gonna shut it out and follow a different path it doesn't feel like you're judging that decision um one way or another or are you I mean is, do you have empathy for the inability to kind of say, oh, like, I'm going to fly, fly my freak flag and then whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have total sympathy for it. I mean, I don't, I don't, I love Madison. Cause I think like she's, she has desires and they're competing and she chooses one, you know, sometimes I wish I was better at doing that. Honestly, like, I feel like I could navigate the world more easily. So yeah, I mean, like, this is the thing I think with writing fiction is like, and sometimes the characters, I really dislike them, um, but I'm working really hard to find some way to stay connected to them. Um, and I'm better at it in fiction than I am in the real world. But yeah, I think for the most part, the thing that animates me the most is, and a lot of people, you know, like my endings are, are like typically happy-ish, you know, and part of it is just because the whole reason I'm writing the book is can I get a character, can I convey them from point A to point B safely? Can I get them to this new place without like killing them? And I'm going to work as hard as I can to make that happen. And so sometimes I need to bend and twist the story, but I want my characters to survive. I, and I don't just mean like stay alive. I mean, I want them to survive in a way that they can keep being who they are in the world. Yeah. Um... And uh, there are deaths in uh, now it's not the time to panic, but we do, yeah, the outcome, it feels like a hopeful, right? Like things are gonna move on, that things have been created that will last. Um, 
but, but I wondered if in some ways, like whether it's the spontaneously combusting children in nothing to see here or which you've talked about is just like in a way a heightened version of children and their meltdowns like this is part of what a child does and it's strange and wild and you know what do you do about it um or in this case where you know Frankie and Zeke form this kind of interesting friendship that maybe is a love relationship maybe it isn't it's it's a kind of obsession and those are things in and of themselves and interesting things happening in these books but I wonder if there are also ways to talk about other things like um, about race or about gender or sexuality, but in a way that um, is sort of in the intensity of the experience rather than a kind of pointing directly to those things. Does that that's, make sense? No, it does. And I mean, I think that's really thoughtful and lovely, and I'm not sure that I'm actually doing that <laughs> very well at all. I mean, a lot of my stories are, I'm writing a lot about uh, uh mental health you know like i'm writing a lot about like um so much of for me like so much of nothing to see here is just like how do you take care of people who are in need right and all of the ways in which uh they might be vilified or othered uh, because of these things that are inherent inside of them how do we make space uh to to protect them and allow them to be the person that they need to be it's not to cure them of their bursting into flames it's to allow them to live in the world without feeling like they should be ashamed of it and the same in some ways with uh now is not the time to panic is how do you make peace with the person that you once were even as you move further and further away from them and all of these ways in which you've changed how do you still hold on to that small kernel of the person that you once were without ever losing it? And I am interested in all, I mean, I'm interested, obviously, like who isn't, I'm interested in the complexities of gender and of race and of sexuality. But like one of the things for me always is like, I just, um, I am not ever going to write the great American novel. Like I can't, I'm very bad at thinking big. Like, I'm very bad at being, like, overt with, like, what I'm interested in. And instead, what I try to do is, like, is Stephen Milhauser says this so much more, more poetically. But, you know, Milhauser is, like, he's talking about novels and short stories. But I think it applies to anything, which is he just says, you know, if you try to embody the entire world, you will ultimately fail. Like, it is impossible to contain the world. But if you write about a single grain of sand and you focus on it completely, if you do it right, you can evoke all the other grains of sand, you can evoke the ocean that touches the sand, you can evoke the ship that's on the ocean, and you can evoke the country all the way on the other side of the world if you do it right. But all you're doing is focusing on that singular piece. And I'm a domestic writer, and I love small little spaces. And, you know, my characters almost never leave, like a room or their town or their home and the reason i'm doing that is because i'm like if i can evoke this clearly enough maybe a little universality applies and i can get some of that big stuff into the novel without coming at it head on i'm just i'm always going to be kind of slippery in how i write uh in that respect yeah well it's a beautiful way to get people to think about all of the themes that you've been talking about tonight without coming up against these hard, big questions, right? I mean, that if you can think about family dynamics through the lens of these children, you know, who, how are, you know, are we gonna contain them? Or are we gonna liberate them? That you can think about a lot of different things. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, has, you know, in a lot of ways you're talking about writing as a mode for us and for you to have compassion for people in the world, to not be scared of them, to kind of not think of them as other. Is it a way for you to feel compassion for yourself? I mean, in the things that you felt like you've had to keep hidden? Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, not to be too personal, but I think like uh, just so many times, I think uh, just so many times I, I, I could have slipped out of this world. It's just, it's just the way it goes. And uh, I'm grateful that I had either the support or people in my life, but also it was art. And so much of the time, before I ever published anything, in so many ways, I was writing stories just to keep myself alive. I was like, okay, I am writing this story. 
and I'm going to get this character from point A to point B. And if I can get that character from point A to point B, at the end of the story, they are still here in this world, and I am still here in this world. And maybe when I finish that story, I can go just a little bit longer, right? Like, because I know how I can operate in this world. And it was just huge for me in that way. And so, yeah, writing is always in some ways trying to understand myself, like allow myself a little more compassion for like things that I initially thought were like awful and terrible and difficult and were going to ruin me. And I would never make it out of the place where I was. And stories were just a way to say, no, you, you, you can write a story. And if you write that story well enough and it's believable and other people accept it, you can find your way to that thing that comes next. So yeah, yeah. that's that's all I'm doing. And your signal has reached the receiver, obviously. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, there's, um, it's interesting because I thought a lot, I was reading this book about who you are, you know, your life overlaps with, or, you know, your coming of age overlaps with the coming of age of Frankie and Sieg, and that, you know, is autobiography a way into your work or not? And there's a great scene near the end. And again, it's part of one of the things that I love about you, like that you're writing, like, you know, you're getting people from point A to point B, but there's always so many other points that keep going. Like even there's this gorgeous little description of the triplets of Frankie's brothers and what happens to them. And you do it in like a paragraph. It's like the economy is beautiful, but you kind of feel like, oh, that's what happened. And we could continue with their story, right? Or you could tell mm -hmm. their story, right? Um, and, and there's a book that, so Frankie has success as, a, like you, she becomes a successful author. Um, but she writes this one book, Sisters with the Same First Name, which is such a great premise. Um, and but she says that it failed. It was like a miserable failure because she tried to write too explicitly about her own life. Um, and it had gotten messed up in the execution. I mean, so I mean, it sounds like in some ways it felt like I, I shouldn't ask you about autobiography based on that passage. But then also I felt compelled to say, well, how are you navigating that yourself? Although it seems like um, you, you've talked about that a little bit. I'm rambling a bit here. Sorry, but I'm no. I'm just curious about that book. Is that a book that you attempted to write that you are going to write? Is there a book that is more explicitly linked to your your life? coming so it's so weird um I, basically every book that i write the kernel of it exists in another book uh like uh so in the family fang there's a the annie the main character is in this movie about children who burst into flames and part of it was like i was like i don't know if i'll ever write another book i gotta get all this stuff into it and then i was like oh god i have to write more books i need that back i'm gonna take that fire kids thing back and then um and, and then there was also the line uh, that's in this book. So I just kept going back and redoing them. But actually that novel that she makes up, I, I wrote that just, I was just like, oh yeah, that's her novel that she tried to be too autobiographical about. But then I was like, uh, oh, I kind of like that. And uh, that's the book I'm working on now is I'm basically just writing that book. Uh, and it's weird. It's probably the least autobiographical uh, of everything I've ever written. But I was like, oh, I think I'm going to actually make that a book and see where it goes. Now, as far as like autobiography, like that's the weird thing is sometimes like people are like, you know, who are you in these? Like, who are you most like? Are you like Lillian or are you like Frankie or are you like Zeke? And I think what's really hard for me is like uh, um, none of them are me uh, and all of them are me, which is like every single character in these books is like, I'm 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 taking a tiny piece of myself and hiding it inside of those characters, like the infinity stones or something, like to keep them all separate so they don't ever form together. But like for me, that's what I'm doing. So all these characters, every single one of them, like Zeke, there's so many elements of him that are me, but like I've got to obscure it so that it's fictional. And that's what's kind of fun about writing. And Frankie is me, but like she's not. And that's what I'm trying to do always. I don't like to write nonfiction. I'm really bad at it. And the way that I write nonfiction is I write fiction. And I'm just <laughs> way better at doing that. Well, this is my last question before we open it up to everyone else's wonderful questions. Um, and it has to do with libraries, because there's a little moment in the book that I love where you kind of give a, a little ode to the library, because when the panic hits the town, and they're trying to figure out like who's making all these photocopies and everything like the Kroger's 
shuts down its copying machines, but the library keeps theirs going, you know, even yeah. though they <laughs> people are copying. So yay, access to information and technology, right? That the <laughs> library is great for. Um, can you talk a little bit about libraries in your own life? I mean, um, and your attachment to them? Yeah, so I will say like, um, growing up where I grew up uh, in Winchester, Tennessee, uh, there was the public library, um, uh, the Winchester Public Library. And and then I went to a small grade school, a, a small school called Good Shepherd, which was run by nuns. And uh, it was tiny. There were six of us in sixth grade and like seven of us in fifth grade. And the nun, we were in the same room and the nun would just turn back and forth to teach the class. She would teach fifth grade, then turn around and teach us. It was just kind of chaotic and strange. And um, because I was a good worker, um, I would get my work done and they would, the nuns would let me just go do chores. So I would just like sweep and clean the hallways and like help them fix the little computers that they bought from Radio Shack. But also they would let me go to the library, which was... Um, it was a um, unair conditioned uh, trailer in the back of the school, and I could go in there and I could just sit in there and read, and um, it was transformative. And like most of the books were from the '40s, so it was like I read so many books about kids with polio, like just kids like making soapbox derbies, like they were old. And I was never reading. Like everyone's like, "Hey, you must have read these formative like Narnia," and I'm like, "No, I did not. I read these books from the '50s, you know that." Uh, I and I read like Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys a thousand times. But once a week, the librarian, Miss Smith, would come and she just noticed that I was always reading. And after a while, she would leave books for me. So when I showed up on my own, there would be a book that she thought I would like. And I read like The Westing Game and uh, The Yearling. And these books were just hugely transformative for me. But more than that, it was to have a librarian, which was the the first adult who weren't my parents or my family who like saw me as a human being like an a, a person who who was worthy of like notice and that i had like could see what i liked and could help me find deeper ways to experience those obsessions and it was just huge it was just such a beautiful thing and i'll just say the last thing is like then and i loved also my public library it was the same thing like but I, my parents, I could walk into that space and my parents were like, you can read anything you want in here, which got me into trouble because like I was in sixth grade reading John Cheever's The Falconer. But like, I love the idea that I could just get anything I wanted from this space and and it, I could take it home and, and have that moment. But then in grad school, I moved to Florida and I lived across the street from the Alachua County Public Library and it's a big library and it was such a an unbelievable thing to walk into this big building and to to really truly see how like community is shaped and formed by a library um there it wasn't just books it was movies it was computers it was music i would get at least two movies a day uh, and bring them back uh, i could get cd's i could sit and study um and it was just such a bustling space and it made me so happy and even now we live in a tiny town and most of what our public library is for is for people that don't have internet access simply to get on a computer so that they can fill out government forms so that they can get the help and access that they need. And what would they do if there wasn't a library? Like to my mind, like you can tell how much a town or a city cares about its population by how uh, a library thrives. And I, I I think the world of them and I know how much they did for me. Thank you, Kevin. It's been so wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much. I am going to hand off uh, to Jill from Wilmette Public Library to manage the Q&A. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Allison. That was wonderful. Um, a friend of mine actually text messaged me during this presentation and said, oh my gosh, Allison me, made me want to just go out and get the book right away. So <laughs> you, you did great. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, so um, first of all, I want to ask kind of a funny question. Kevin, have you ever thought of being an audiobook narrator? 
because I feel like you could do it. <laughs> oh, so for for this book, I love audiobooks, by the way. Like they, I, I listen to so many books on audiobook, and um, and I've just been really lucky. I've had just unbelievable narrators for all of my books, but for this one. There was the small essay I wrote and they said, we'd love for you to read it because it's only 15 minutes. And they sent me to a studio in Nashville. It was so professional. And I did it in one go. And they were like, you are really good at this, man. You are great. And I was like, hot damn, maybe this is a new career. And they said, there's just a one little thing, like the opening line, you need to, could you try to hit it differently? And then I spent 10 minutes uh, messing up that single line <laughs> over and over and over again. I was like, oh no, I, I could never, I could never do this. Uh, it was so wild, like how much I started to hear my voice and I couldn't do it. Yeah, well, I will say if you, you know, if you ever get need, need a little sojourn away from uh, writing, I think that you could, you could be successful. Oh, thank um. you. <laughs> And okay, great. So we have some we have some good questions coming in here. Um, and the first one is um, I loved Frankie's adoration for Randolph, and vice versa. It was a great look at an older artist's relationship with a young struggling artist. As an adult and accomplished writer, what do you wish your younger self knew about art? Oh, that's lovely. I mean, so much of it is like uh, things that I've been saying, which is one like. I think there's a lot of pressure when you think I am making art, you want it to be, um, you want other people to appreciate it. You want to be seen. And one of the things that I wish my younger self knew was like, no, you, you can never, you cannot control other people's response to the thing that you make. Um, and so you have to make certain that, that you are deriving pleasure from the generation of it. And that really and truly the only thing you can control is the pleasure that you get from the made thing and to worry less about what will happen after. Like there are so many things about luck that you can't control. And so really and truly just to appreciate the quiet time where you are the only person in charge of what you're making. Um, and the other thing is just also like not to want success too soon because like the stuff I wrote when I was 19 was terrible and uh, I'm glad that it's not out in the world in some way. Like writing and art is a lifetime pursuit and I really love the idea that like it will continue for as long as you want and not to try to rush all of these things at the beginning. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, so, so one person asked, how did you get into the mind of teens so well? <laughs> oh, well, I think my wife would say it's because I'm fairly stunted in like, <laughs> my like emotional like IQ is that I feel like a teenage, I feel like a child still, like the way in which I perceive the world at a lot of times is still with that anxiety of being a teenager. And I'll just say also like, um, Having children, like one of the kind of wondrous things is to watch them experience the world and connect it back to your own and realize how different they can be. And yet there's these connective pieces. Um, and so I think that's just helpful. And I teach at a university, so I'm seeing young people all the time. And there's just ways in which they're so perceptive and there's other ways in which they feel so young and so much of the world to experience. And so I like writing about teenagers because they're on the precipice of something huge. It's always fun to write about characters like that. And so I just try to remember, even though my experience is not universal, that anxiety and and yet it, like excitement of what you might become. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Uh, let's see. Is there anything that you're hoping that people will take away from this book, kind of an overall message? <laughs> oh man, I wish. I, I Like I said, like you can't control what anyone else does with the thing that you make. Like all I am trying to do really and truly is to tell a story in a way that a, a reader follows it through to the end. And that's it. There's no larger message in some ways other than um, trying to allow the reader like enough depth and complexity in the story so that they can feel connected to it even as they find ways in which to like make it personal to themselves so there is no larger message I mean it's a book about this weird line 
that I heard when I was 19 years old. <laughs> like, I don't know how I could ever draw a deeper message out of it other than like, this is a singular story. Can you find something in it that connects to you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody wrote in between Lillian and nothing to see here and Frankie in this book, do you find it easier in some way to write from the perspective of women or preferable for your process in some way? So, uh, I, I've, so every novel I've written has had a female main character and I've written in their perspective. And you'd think after all this time, I would have a way better answer about this other than to say like, I think it's complicated. So one is about like, as Allison mentioned with autobiography, like writing from the perspective of writing with uh, a female character allows me a slight bit of plausible deniability. Like this is not me. There's no way, reason for the reader to believe that this is the author. So it gives me just a little bit of distance to do the work that I want to do, but I could do that with any, you know, like that's why am I always writing in the perspective of a woman? And part of it is also just like one, so much of my life has been shaped by by the women who I love and the women who have been such a big part of my life. And I've always kind of loved observing like the differences of experience, but it's also just like, for whatever reason in my own personal life, like entering into the perspective of a woman and writing from the perspective of a woman for the time that I'm in that book is just really comfortable and really lovely for me. And it's a kind of gift uh, that I don't have in the real world at this moment. So like being able to write in those perspectives feels like something that's meaningful to me. And I think it's why I seek it out because it is comfortable and I like it and I love those characters. And for the time that I'm making the book, I get to be that character for a moment. So yeah, it's someday I'll figure it all out entirely, but that's that's one of the larger reasons. Now you said that your wife is one of the few people that you show your your writing to. Does she ever give you any sort of feedback, or does she kind of stand off? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I only like I said. Like my wife is really one of the only two people that reads the work. And part of it is like I'm so in my head. I don't want a lot of suggestions. And my wife knows me. We've been together for so long, and she's a writer too. So we both know what each of us is trying to get at but we also know the limitations of our perceptions of the world that make it harder to reach the reader so my wife often is just like this thing that you think is universal and like explicit and understandable is not to most people so is there a way to open this up and I really love that that she's like I know what you want and I'm going to help you like figure out how to make that work. Right. And mm -hmm. like, what else could you ask for from a reader, someone that knows you so well that they can anticipate what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, somebody wrote in a really great question. Um, what was the inspiration for grandma's affinity for the sneakers Air Jordans? Incredible imagery and delightfully comical. Oh man, I, well, I just love, I, this is the first book I've ever written with a good parent. And uh, <laughs> my, I was just like, you know what, this book, I'm going to make this mom good, nice, sweet. And I just tried to think of all the things that I would, you know, would be cool. And, and, you know, everyone has that obsessive thing. And I just thought, oh, for her, it's sneakers. And part of it is just my own thing. I love sneakers. And my son and I are constantly at Goodwill, on eBay, like at thrift stores. I just love shoes. I love what they look like. I love like the stories behind them. We love basketball. And so part of that sneakers Air Jordans thing is just like what I hope my retirement years are, which is just me <laughs> spending our nest egg down on Air Jordan sneakers. <laughs> I just was like, what other, what wonderful thing could you have? But to be a grandma, and have any Air Jordan you want. So yeah, I just threw it in there. Yeah, the cool grandma. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, you know, this has been delightful and we are so grateful. Thank you so much, Allison and Kevin. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time this evening to talk to us and be our, agreeing to be our, our one book for the whole community of Wilmette and, and beyond. And it was a pleasure to have you. We planned 
tons of programming around this book. We had book club discussions with the public, with our own staff. Um, so we really made a celebration out of this book. And I think it was the perfect book for us to discuss in 2023. So just thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It means the world to me. And thank you, Allison. And thank you to everyone that read the book. I, I, I can't thank you enough. No, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for coming and, you know, like Kevin talked about, supporting your library. We have a wonderful community in Wilmette and Evanston. And just thank you so much to everybody who came out to support us this evening. And um, this video, please recommend family and friends. Watch for the second time. It should be on YouTube, um, the library's YouTube um, tomorrow afternoon at the latest. So thank you so much. And I just want to wish everybody a pleasant rest of your evening. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.